Today we are doing meal prep on a budget and I'm making five portions of a breakfast, lunch and dinner. Along with price, my other considerations were ease of preparation, nutritional value and flavour. And I think I've scored quite well in all areas. Almost all ingredients were purchased from Aldi and when calculating the cost of each meal, I have sometimes used proportional costs, but only where it's realistic for you to keep and use whatever isn't required in the recipes. For example, if six eggs cost £1.68 and we use one, I'd say that cost you 28 pence because you get to keep the rest of the eggs. However, for items where you might not be likely to use whatever remains, I've added the total cost just for fairness. All right, let's do it. Let's start with breakfast and most certainly the easiest of our meals to prepare, overnight oats. For our base recipe, we're using oats, protein powder, natural yogurt, chia seeds, and almond milk. Then you can top those however you like, but I will show you a few different variants. Quick note on some ingredients. Rolled oats are probably the best for overnight oats because they have a bit more texture. Instant oats will work fine, but things will just end up a bit more mushy. Chia seeds aren't entirely necessary, but again, they will improve the texture because they'll absorb a lot of liquid and help thicken things up. Yogurt can be Greek or natural with or without fat. I just grabbed the cheapest one. Almond milk can be swapped for any milk. And I'm using vanilla protein powder because it's the most neutral that I have, but really use any flavor you like. This is going to be providing the sweetness, so if you do use unflavored, you might want to add some honey. Step one of a total of one steps, mix everything together. You shouldn't need to pre-mix your protein powder because the oats and seeds will help break up any lumps, so the only thing you need to remember for this is you can always add more milk, but you can't take it away. Nobody wants to be out here distilling overnight oat mixtures, right? So just add a little to start with and then gradually add more until you reach desired consistency. Don't forget your oats and seeds are going to absorb a fair bit of liquid. So you do want it to be considerably more runny than you'd like it when you consume it. Something like this is about where it should be. So by the following day, it will be thick enough to stay on a spoon, which is probably the, the minimum level of consistency you're looking for, to be quite honest. Anyway, when you're done, just dish it out into your containers. Definitely don't use a ladle for this. That's a ridiculous utensil choice, but I could not locate my big spoon. Obviously, you also don't need to buy specific overnight oats containers with stupid little spoons that aren't even long enough to reach the bottom. You can just use tumblers and cover them with cling film or any old jars that you've got lying around. You know, because we've all got loads of jars lying around. Anyway, my advice would be to store the oats as is and then top them before consuming each morning. If you start chopping fruit up, it's not going to last very long and it'll just end up soggy and generally undesirable. Provided the date on your yogurt was okay, these will actually be fine in the fridge for about five days, but I probably wouldn't go longer than that. So you can just take one out each morning and add whatever toppings you feel like. I went with peanut butter and banana, apple cinnamon and sultanas, and blueberry and lemon zest. All solid and offer something a little bit different on the palate, but you can get as creative as you desire. I know these are a very typical go-to breakfast meal prep, and you've probably seen them in a million other videos, but I think they are popular for a reason. I've tried quite a few different breakfast meal prep ideas, and I think when all things are considered, these do come out on top. Next up for lunch, we're making some sticky honey soy chicken with rice and broccoli. So we're starting out with the bodybuilder holy trinity of chicken, rice and broccoli. However, I'm going to use some chicken thigh instead of the usual breast. Now, when you buy skinless and boneless, these aren't really any cheaper than chicken breast, but anyone with a tongue knows that the thigh is the superior culinary choice. And especially when meal prepping, that extra little bit of fat content is going to help keep it tender and enjoyable after it's been in the fridge or freezer. For our marinade, you can do the really simple version using just soy, honey, and sesame oil, but I think it's worth using the added extras shown here. And let's start with that marinade. So I'm going to go in with some soy first i did add a splash of dark soy later but it's not necessary then you want to mix in your corn flour before adding anything else that's corn starch to americans i went for two spoons like that and this is going to thicken up your marinade so that it sticks to the chicken but don't expect it to do much yet because it doesn't start gelatinizing until it's heated then for some honey which you could swap for brown sugar if you like i'm adding some garlic because i'm using it in the next recipe but you could also add ginger or both and then some chili again really optional i was lazy so i just microplaned this instead of finally chopping finally a drop of sesame oil just for flavor and then we're going to make sure it's well mixed before placing some off to one side in a bowl that we'll use to brush the chicken with whilst cooking then for the grim job of chopping our chicken i'll spare you too many close-ups just cut them into roughly equal sized pieces and place in your bowl to marinate now I'll put the rice on and as in previous videos, I'm not going to go through a breakdown of cooking rice. If you find it difficult, get a rice cooker because that's a very gentle method of cooking rice, which makes it pretty hard to get wrong. 
Broccoli needs chopping up and steaming, so let's do that. It doesn't really matter which order you do all these steps in because everything has to cool down before you put it in the fridge or freezer anyway. Only thing I'd say about your broccoli is air on the side of al dente. I don't know if you can say al dente about things that aren't pasta, but you know what I mean? A little under because it will cook a little when you reheat your meals in the microwave and there's not really much worse in life than mushy broccoli. I'm using the air fryer to cook my chicken and I'm just going to start that on 180 degrees but ignore the time because I'm going to add to that later. The broccoli's done so let's take that off. Rice is done so let's take the lid off, give that a little floof. And then after 10 or 12 minutes I'm going to brush my chicken with some of that extra sauce we put aside earlier. Then give it a little mix around because there's a lot of chicken in a small air fryer and it's not all being exposed to the heat evenly. A little shake of some toasted sesame seeds and back in for another 10 or 12 minutes. Might as well start dishing things out in the meantime and then we'll go in for another sauce application. And I wasn't really happy with the level of crisp so I upped the temperature to 200 for the final 5 or 6 minutes after which we had some really delightful chicken thigh. Final step, this is a difficult one, put stuff in boxes. These will be fine in the fridge for 3 days so anything that you won't eat in that time can go in the freezer. When you do come to eat them, obviously do what you want but I'd recommend a little bit of sesame oil, maybe a bit of chilli oil on the rice just for a bit of extra lubrication and check that chicken out. Really pleasant stuff. I know I'm literally a walking cliche doing chicken, rice and broccoli but I'm aware that it's a cliche and doing it anyway so that actually makes me a maverick contrarian. For my dinner meal, I'm going to make a creamy meatball orzo for which we will need some form of minced meat, orzo, a hard Italian cheese, lemon, egg, garlic, chicken stock and creme fraiche and then some frozen peas. Okay, a couple of quick notes on ingredients. I'm using 5% fat beef mince but honestly, I'd go 10% or more if I were you. They just didn't have it in the denomination that I needed in Aldi. I actually think flavour wise, turkey, even chicken meatballs might be better but again, I just couldn't find anything appropriate whilst keeping the cost down. I use the phrase Italian hard cheese because you could use parmesan or even pecorino but I'm using Grana Padano because it tends to be cheaper and before someone's nonna comes at me, I'm not saying that there aren't differences between these cheeses there are I'm just saying that they'd all work in this dish all right let's do it first up we're making meatballs so you can go as extravagant as you like with these but I'm keeping things simple so just meat egg and some seasoning breadcrumbs aren't necessary and I don't think they add much to a meatball so I'm not using any but I do think a good move would have been to grate some of your cheese into the meatball mixture especially if you're using a leaner meat I'm only using a bit of salt because the dish will be salty enough and then quite a lot of pepper and then I randomly just pulled some dried herbs out the cupboard honestly chuck anything you have available available or nothing extra in at this stage. A good tip for even meatballs is to place your bowl on the scales so that you know the size of each is roughly equal. I'm using this dish so something roughly those proportions will work well although it doesn't need to be quite that deep. Little glug of olive oil in the pan on a high heat but depending on your pan and also the fat content of your meatballs that's not always necessary. Then we're going to give these meatballs a good sear on each side so place them all in, resist the temptation to move them around for 3-5 to five minutes and have a look to see what that sear is looking like. Give them all a flip to do the other side, if there even is another side of a sphere, probably not but you know what I'm saying. Anyway we might as well grate some cheese whilst we're waiting for those. This is how much I've used, not loads. And next we'll prepare our chicken stock which is already quite salty, hence why we didn't add too much to the meatballs earlier. Once we have a good colour on those meatballs we can remove them from the pan and add our garlic. If you use fresh chopped garlic you might want to give this a minute before adding everything else but turn the heat down and let the pan cool a little bit first because there is no return from burnt garlic. Next we'll add the orzo, the chicken stock, about half of this tub of creme fraiche all of our cheese and an optional juice of a half a lemon. Does that make sense? Probably not. Let's carry on. Next we're going to mix everything until evenly distributed and then re-add our meatballs to cook through. You want this at a gentle simmer and I'm keeping the lid on because I don't want it to dry out. You can check on it and add more boiling water if you need to. I'd give this about 15 minutes before then finally adding your peas and replacing the lid for a final 5 minutes. I'm going to dish this out, let it cool in the containers because that's just going to be much faster than leaving it in the pan. Probably should have mentioned this earlier, but just make sure your number of meatballs is divisible by the number of portions you're making. You know, you don't want to be getting your protractor out to evenly divide individual meatballs, do you? That just sounds like a hassle we could all live without. So there we have it. We have breakfast, lunch and dinner that we can prepare on a Sunday, then eat Monday through Friday. It's all tasty stuff and for the current climate, I'd say that's relatively budget friendly to be honest. Hopefully you try these out yourself as usual, tag me in your IG stories if you do because I do enjoy seeing you all 
butcher the very simplest of recipes. All right, love you guys. See ya. Joe Delaney is my hero.